mosquitoes and monkeys. I recently saw two television programs. One was about some researchers in the Arctic Circle and another was about war in the deserts of Egypt. And when I saw these two programs, I realised that in my imagination, both the Arctic, the great wastes of Arctic ice, and the desert were vast, empty spaces. But according to these two programmes, my imagination didn't have much to do with the reality. Because what the researchers in the Arctic found very quickly is that the Arctic was full of mosquitoes. And what those soldiers in the Egyptian desert discovered, the desert was alive with flies so that they could hardly get their food to their mouth without taking in a whole mass of flies as well. And that made me think of meditation. It's very easy to think of meditation as emptying the mind, of creating some vast, calm space in the mind. But you can only really think that if you haven't actually been there and tried it. So we begin to meditate. Some of us have a lovely experience of peace very early on, perhaps the first time we meditate. For others, that more difficult discovery comes straight away. The discovery that the mind is far from being a vast, calm, empty space, but is full of distractions. It turns out to be impossible to keep the mind still, to stop it from thinking. The mind is very distracted. But if we have some friends along the way, what we will also discover and be encouraged by is that it is the same for everyone. And indeed, it always has been. If we dip into the writings of some of the great men and women of prayer through the centuries, we will find them talking of the same thing that we experience today. John Cassian, way back in the fourth century, describes his mind at the time of prayer, even at the time of prayer, he says, when he expects it to be calmest, he says, it's moving around, and I'm wandering around as if I'm drunk. Theophan the Recluse from the 19th century says, thoughts continue to jostle in your mind like mosquitoes. Our Hindu friends use the image of the monkey mind that the mind is like a tree full of monkeys chattering away and swinging from branch to branch in constant motion. And those are extremely good descriptions of what we discover in our own experience. So, join the club. This is the way it is to be human. It always has been like that. Your mind has always been like that. You're just realising it for the first time. Scientists can tell us how many times the neurons are firing inside our brain. So the way to help ourselves with that is simply to accept it. It is the way it is. But we're not helpless in the face of it. Teresa Ravela says, distractions and the wandering mind are part of the human condition and can no more be avoided than eating or sleeping. But this awareness of the distracted mind can turn out to be a first step in our self-knowledge and therefore a friend to us along the way if we can first accept it. If you cannot catch the wind, say the Desert Fathers, neither can you stop distractions from coming into your mind. So what can we do about it? Here's a Chinese proverb. You cannot prevent birds flying around your head, but you can prevent them making nests in your hair. And Theophan the recluse again says, thoughts continue to jostle in your mind like mosquitoes. To stop this jostling, 
you must bind the mind with one thought, or the thought of the one only. And so the way we do this is to take our word, our one word, our one phrase, our mantra, and we give that our attention. We keep on saying it, we keep on giving it our attention, and we keep on going back to it every time we've been distracted, our mind's been drawn away from it. We bind our thought with the one word. Our friends in Zen say, treat thoughts like empty boats floating down the river. Let them float by. Don't be tempted to jump on board. From the 18th century, the Jesuit Jean-Pierre de Cossard says, let thoughts drop away as you might let stones drop into the sea. Sometimes they are more like rubber balls which float around us. So we're not trying to get rid of our thoughts or push them out or empty our mind in some sort of way. We're really saying, it doesn't matter what the thoughts do. It doesn't matter what they do. They're just like a sort of background noise. What I'm most interested in is saying the mantra. The thoughts can do what they want. They can hang around in the background, they can go away, they can be replaced by others, but I'm simply not interested in them. I'm going to keep my attention fixed on the mantra. So we don't need to use any energy to dispel them. We use all the energy we need for saying our word. We don't do anything violent. This is a peaceful practice. We simply forgive ourselves by coming back to the word. We're preferring what abides, what lasts. We prefer God to the thoughts and feelings and activities of the mind which simply come and go. We let them come and go. And the mantra is for us a little tool which keeps us on track and gives us the most direct and gentle and forgiving way to come back when we've wandered off. And in that we begin to find our first taste of freedom. We may not be able to, we cannot stop thoughts from coming into our mind, but as soon as we become aware that we're distracted, we have a freedom of choice. We can stay with them or we can come back to the world.